Thank you very much for that very warm welcome, Sister and Brother Comrade Sol. May I start off, Sister and Brother, by bringing to you warm fraternal greetings from the free people of Revolutionary Guinea. See how very, very pleasant it is to be back in New York among you, to be in this great hall where there are so many hundreds of our sisters and brothers. That is going to bring a great deal of pleasure to our free people, and I will certainly report your warmth, your enthusiasm, and your revolutionary support for our protest. on the record our deep appreciation too for the people responsible in Hunter College for lending us this facility this evening. I know it is very difficult to find places that can hold a lot of people in New York and therefore we are very happy to have been able to get Hunter College. Dr. Hodges who spoke before me was very kind in his remarks, and I would like you to express our appreciation to him and to ask him to convey to all at Hunter College the, our deep gratefulness for having been able to get this opportunity. Of course, we are here among friends. But looking around, there are two people here who are right now representing their country at the United Nations. People who are involved in liberation struggles. People who are struggling for their national liberation, for justice, for freedom for their countries, freedom for their peoples. It is very important right at the beginning, sisters and brothers, that we acknowledge the presence of Dr. Tilsey, the representative of the United States of America. Of South Africa, the black majority, 
who have spent so much time in ensuring that those people are not able to reclaim their true patrimony. They are now discovering that in common with all of the national liberation movements around the world that are forced to move to the high stage of the struggle that the African National Congress is also doing. Afro-Americans in this country. 
country. I want to let you know that it was precisely because of the pressures that were brought by our friends in the Black Caucus that the visa was eventually granted. and strengthen the people-to-people -people relations which have always existed between our two countries, Grenada and the United States. At the level of the people, there has never been any problem. At the level of the people, we have always had excellent relations with the people of the United States. In fact, as you know, in some years, more American tourists come to our country than the entire population of the country. <laughs> and if we go around and we take a careful count in the United States, we may well discover that there are more Grenadians living in the United States than the whole population of Grenada. <laughs> And on top of that, there is a medical school in Grenada. And at this medical school, over 700 young Americans are earning their rights to become doctors, are getting a career in Grenada. So from our point of view, clearly bad relations do not make sense. From our point of view, the need to deepen ties, the need to ensure that even more American visitors come to our country every year is a critical and burning need. And the opportunity, therefore, to speak directly to the people of the United States was a very important opportunity. We also set an objective of trying to make contact with as many sectors and sections of American society as we could during this period. And to this end, of course, there have been several meetings this past week with congressmen and with different other influential people in the society. We have attempted over this period also to try to talk to as many people from the media as we could reach, not just in press conferences, but in informal briefings where a great deal more can be done than just in a direct question and answer session before the press. That objective, too, has gone quite well. And another objective that we had, of course, was to use the period to deepen our relations with some of our closest friends in the United States, with our black American sisters and brothers, with our Grenadian and Caribbean nationals, with those progressive forces right across the United States who have given us so much support unstintingly, to those who lead and are hard workers in the friendship societies and the solidarity committees, we were very anxious to touch bases, to speak to the sisters and brothers, to express our appreciation for the hard work that they have done and to give them some idea as to what we were doing at this time in Grenada. That objective also has gone well. And another objective was to try yet again to establish some form of official contact and official dialogue with the government of the United States. We, of course, cannot decide which government is going to be in power in the United States, at any given moment in time. That is a matter of for the people of the United States. And whoever happens to be in power at a particular time, we believe it is extremely important 
for us to maintain normal relations so that we are able to conduct proper dialogue in a civilized fashion. It's an interesting historical anecdote that in the last century, and I remember seeing a film once with John Wayne starring, <laughs> that in the last century, when Japan had decided that they wanted no one to come to their country, that they were going to cut themselves off from the rest of the world, that they were going to become totally self-sufficient within their own borders, and so as to preserve what they saw as their special culture, etc., that they would allow no normal intercourse to the rest of the world. It is a historical fact that the United States on that occasion sent an ambassador without forewarning to Japan. And when they arrived, they said, we are here, you must talk, because this is what international relations demands. <laughs> it's a kind of, if the mountain won't come to you, you got to go to the mountain. I do not, of course, say that is the basis on which we are here. <laughs> but I make the point, because I think it is an important point, that really, in 1983, not 1793, <laughs> how can countries still operate on the basis of not having an official permanent channel of communication? question of ideological differences, the question of different parts of socio-economic and political development, the question of geopolitical perspectives and of strategic consensuses and whatnot is really neither here nor there in the final analysis. The fact of the matter is, if there is no established mechanism for holding dialogue, then there is no basis on which relations can be maintained in an effective way. We believe it is in the duty, it is in the interest of both the peoples of the United States and of Grenada to have normal relations between our two governments. We believe that is important because too much is at stake here. Too many of our own nationals live in this country and too many American citizens and students live in our country. There is a need for some kind of mechanism to be established. And that is why we have been struggling so hard over all of these years to try to get some of the basic norms re-established. Let us exchange ambassadors, we have said. They have rejected that. So we have no ambassador accredited to Washington because they refuse to accept the credentials of the ambassador we have suggested. When they replaced their ambassador after the electoral victory of President Reagan in 1980, and the new ambassador came out in 1981. He was not, in fact, accredited to Grenada. So we have to talk, presumably, using loudspeakers. <laughs> and even when we write letters, like I did, for example, in 1981, on two occasions to President Reagan, in March and again in August. First letter, short letter, making the simple, obvious point. Look, you are a new president. We had hoped that as a new president, you would have taken a new look at the situation. That you would have been anxious to start off on as good relations as you can with all countries around the world. We had hoped that you, therefore, would have wanted relations normalized. And we went on in that letter to make the point that what we are saying is the true bottom line is dialogue, it is talks. 
Therefore, let us get these talks going. We are proposing no agenda with any preconditions. Let us look at all questions. Let us put them all on the table. Let us see what you perceive as problems. We will tell you what we perceive as problems. Let us see if in the course of those discussions, we can narrow down differences. So at least the new beginning that is made will be done on a basis of mutual understanding with less distrust and less suspicion. No reply to that letter. The second letter was August 1981. And this was a very long letter, about 12 type pages. And the reason there were 12 type pages was not because there were 12 type pages talking about an agenda. There were 12 type pages because by that time, the hostile, aggressive course of destabilization against our government by the Ronald Reagan administration had been well established. So the letter went into the question of the propaganda destabilization against us. It went into the question of the economic destabilization against us. We were able to speak about the discrimination that is exercised against banana farmers in our country. We were able to speak about the attempt to offer money to the Caribbean Development Bank on the sole condition that we would be excluded. We were able to raise a number of these issues, including the fact too, that in April 1981, when we had organized a co-financing conference to raise funds for our international air force project, the American administration sent their diplomats to European capitals trying to persuade member countries of the EEC for not attending that conference. We raised in that letter also the question of military destabilization, which was already beginning. We pointed out the fact that one well-known mercenary in April of 1981 had gone publicly on television in this country admitting that he was training mercenaries in Miami for an invasion of our country. Admitting that he was recruiting mercenaries. This man's name, as some of you may have seen that program, was John Day, a well-known mercenary. And we said, well, how can you allow this in your country? There are international conventions against this kind of thing. And sending Marines directly to somebody's country is no less a sin than allowing mercenaries to be supplied, to be trained, and to have a logistical base on your own territory. So we raised all of these points. Once again, we said we are willing to talk at whatever level is deemed appropriate. Let us make a start. Again, no reply. So the fact is, sisters and brothers, we have had this long, long history of trying to see in what ways relations could be normalized, are working very hard, are trying to get some form of dialogue going, and we have had very little success in this regard. But I really want to say tonight that we do believe it is important for us to continue that struggle. And therefore, notwithstanding the difficulties in the way, we deem it very advisable for us to continue to press for a full normalization of relations. But of course, as we press for normalization, we are also going to continue to build our revolution. We are also going to continue to consolidate our process. In the face of all of the difficulties, in the face of all of the economic destabilization, the political, diplomatic, and military threats and pressure, we don't intend to roll over and play like an ostrich. We are going to stand up. And as you know, sisters and brothers, becoming more and more difficult for developing third world countries to go forward. 
Because unfortunately our economies remain by and large dependent on and tied to the capitalist world economies. And therefore when the capitalist world goes through their cyclical crises one after the other, it has an immediate effect on us. As we say at home, when the capitalist world catches a cold, we catch pneumonia. <laughs> And the crisis in the capitalist world has been deep. The cycles seem to be coming now every three to four years. In the old days, the cycles used to come every ten years. And then they would say, well, yes, recession, we're going to come back up and you have a boom, then recession, come back up and boom. Now that's happening every three years. And when the recession starts, it doesn't look like it is coming back up. And the boom side looks like it's a long way off. And while that is happening, Inside of their own countries, there are all kinds of problems. The OECD countries, for example, it is estimated that over 35 million people in those 12, 13 countries are out of jobs. 35 million. It is estimated too that in the United States, there are perhaps 12 million people out of work. In Britain, perhaps 4 million people out of work. In all of the developed industrialized countries, there is greater and greater unemployment. And as this unemployment goes deeper and deeper into the society, the people who feel it the most are the poor and working people. The massive part that. The massive cuts in social welfare the cuts are not coming in the arms race. The cuts are not coming out of the arms budget. I understand the talk is to spend three trillion dollars over five years. The mind bubbles. Three trillion dollars is not even three billion, which is three thousand million. But it is three thousand billion. And if you work out three trillion dollars over five years, which is what, about 1,745 days, if you work that out, you'll discover it comes down to a spending of 1.6 billion United States dollars a day. 1.6 billion. That is the kind of money that is supposed to be consumed in our but while that kind of money is being consumed in arms, hospitals are closing down. Jobs are being, more and more retrenchment is taking place. Pensions are being reduced. Medi Medicaid is being reduced. In other words, the arms is swallowing up the money. The people are not benefiting. This crisis in the capitalist world, moreover, has led to a situation where more and more of their countries, especially in 1982, were able to experience only negative growth. Their economies were growing, were growing backwards by minus 5% and minus 4% and minus 3%, right up and down through the industrialized countries. But the effect this has had on us in turn, countries of the developing world, has been to also create a crisis in the developing world. In the developing world as a whole, it is now estimated that our debts exceed $650 billion. That is how much money we owe collectively. And it is not just the amount of money that is owed by one or two well-known cases like Mexico or Argentina, where you are talking about staggering debts of over $80 billion. But perhaps over 35 countries in the developing world now owe about $1 billion or more in debt in a context where they are still unable to create the necessary surpluses and to repay the debts. Just servicing of debts alone is causing massive problems for the countries of the third world. Last year, 
$131 billion was spent on the countries of the third world in just servicing their debt, just paying the interest, not one cent back on the capital. And that took $131 billion. Last year, too, the amount of money that we lost, the purchasing power of the countries of the third world fell again and fell very, very dramatically. It is estimated that over the last two years, in fact, 1981 and 1982, third world developing countries lost $85 billion in purchasing power. Purchasing power via the credits we lost, via the real prices we should have gotten for our commodities, which we lost because the prices of our commodities keep falling, and via also high interest rates. These three combinations meant this massive loss of purchasing power for third world developing countries. But on top of that, we are also discovering that it is becoming more and more difficult to engage in trade with the countries of the Western industrialized world. I have some figures here from Latin America that are very instructive. Well, first of all, in terms of the total world trade figures, the developing world as a whole, in 1955, that is to say some 30 years ago, in 1955, the developing world as a whole had 40% of total world trade. But by 1969, some 12 years ago, that figure had dropped to 25%. In other words, we lost 15% of the world market in the meantime. For non-oil developing countries, the drop was even as dramatic, notwithstanding the fact that they were earning fairly large surpluses from oil. Trade is also increasingly difficult for us because of the high tariff barriers which are put up in pursuance of protectionist policies, tariff and non-tariff barriers. But even as they make it more difficult for us to trade with them, the whole question of aid, which at one time used to be regarded as a kind of duty, that the developed capitalist world, the developed industrialized world had. If duty it was, that duty has virtually disappeared. Because the reality is that aid has also decreased quite dramatically for third world countries. Long ago, the United Nations set a target that all of the developed industrialized countries should aim to provide us aid 0.7% of their gross domestic product. And so far as I know from the latest figures we have seen, not one single industrialized country has yet attained that target. And far from attaining that target, collectively they are now giving only 0.45% of their GDP as aid. So trade is virtually out, aid is also going. In the old days also, it was possible to supplement some of this through direct investments. In Latin America, some years ago, if you take 1946, about 40 years ago in Latin America, 43% of all direct United States investments went to Latin America, 43%. But by the beginning of the 70s, that 43% in fact had dropped to 17%. 26% of the investments had been shifted away from Latin America and into Europe. So more and more, when there is money to be invested, the investments are no longer going to the third world developing countries. The investments are either staying in their own countries or going to the countries of their friends. So investment is also a problem. But on top of that, the international financial institutions, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, in the early period of those banks, it was a bit easier to have obtained loans from the banks. The International Monetary Fund, as you know, is the only source for balance of payment support. 
and the World Bank can be a source for project, project lending. But more and more, because of the influence of one or two countries, in particular of one country, it is now becoming virtually impossible to get loans from the IMF or the World Bank. In fact, we know that there is a hit list which has been developed with countries like Grenada and Nicaragua, Angola and Mozambique on this hit list. And once any of these countries make an application to the International Monetary Fund, regardless of how good technically their program is, the instructions are to try to find all possible ways of blocking those sources of funding. Grenada has had that experience on two occasions already. And we are now going through a third experience in that regard. So we understand what this hit list can do to third world developing countries that are looking for ways of financing their public investment program. But not satisfied with all of that, what they have now done after cutting off aid, cutting off trade, cutting off investment, making it virtually impossible to get money through the international financial institutions, now they are forcing more and more third world countries to go directly to the international capital market, to the big commercial banks to get loans. And as you know, when you go to one of these banks to get a loan, First of all, you have to have what they call a credit rating. And to get a credit rating, you have to go through the same World Bank and IMF. So everybody can get credit rating. But even after you get a credit rating, you have to then deal with the question of very short repayment terms and very high interest rates. They have all kind of fancy words they use, 1% above LIBOR. <laughs> and when you translate those words, it's 60 and 17% interest. That's really what it means. <laughs> sounds good. It sounds like a pill that is killing you, but you can't, you know, it sounds, it sounds like a sweet. But the reality is that by forcing us more and more to have to go to the international capital market, the debt trap is intensified even more. In the 1960s, if you look at statistics for the world, you would probably have discovered that less than 1% of all money borrowed from the international banks was being borrowed by third world countries, less than 1%. But by today, that figure, that percentage is substantially raised. And that is why collectively, we have this $650 billion in debts that we have to pay back. And while all of this is going on, sisters and brothers, there are so many people in the world who are unemployed, so many people in the world who are going hungry, to bed hungry every single night. So many millions in the third world who are illiterate and whose governments either do not care or feel they cannot do anything to solve that problem. Unemployment, hunger, malnutrition, disease, illiteracy, these are the crimes and the sins that have visited upon the poor developing countries of the third world, while the industrialized countries continue to exploit our resources and to keep the profits. You think of a banana farmer? or a banana worker in Grenada. And you consider what happens to the sweat of that banana farmer and banana worker. In Grenada, the particular transnational corporation we deal with is one called Geest Industries. Van Geest. Mr. Van Geest was a man who came from Holland originally, went to England and opened a flower shop and then discovered that there was more money in ships than in flowers. So he got into the shipping business, eventually developed a monopoly of transporting bananas from many, many Caribbean countries to the English market. 
And the way in which this thing is structured, it works out that for every dollar that is obtained from the sale of bananas, the banana workers and the banana farmers are made to share 10 cents. And the other 90 cents goes in one form or another to Mr. Van Gies and his type. 10 cents for all of that labor and sweat. And that should give as good an indication as it is possible to give of the inequities and injustice in the system. But yes, sisters and brothers, in the face of all of this, the Grenada Revolution has nonetheless continued to go forward and to make progress. At a time when even the big, powerful, industrialized nations were growing backwards last year, we grew forward by 5.5%. coming out of the whole history of negative development and retrogression on the Gary, when year after year it was backward growth over the last four years of the revolution, cumulatively we have grown by over 15 percent. While in those countries that can spend so many trillions of dollars on arms, their people are out of work and daily being pushed more out of work. The revolution in Grenada, starting from a base from Gary of 49% unemployment, one in every two people who wanted to work couldn't get a job. And among women, 70% unemployed, 7 out of every 10 could not get a job. Therefore, at the dawn of the revolution, over 22,000 people who wanted to work could not find work. Coming from that base, when we did a census last year, April 1982, the unemployment rate had dropped from 49% to down to 14.2%. <laughs> political, social, and spiritual devastation of our country and our people. In those days, there was no such thing as a plan. There was no such thing as a capital investment program, partly because Gary was a mystic. <laughs> and therefore, he didn't have the plan. But also partly because he was so corrupt that nobody was willing in any event to pass even a 10 cents in his hand unless they send out 10 police to check on what happened with their 10 cents. <laughs> so in those days we had nothing called a public investment program and when it got going, it got going on the basis of little very small people advances. The last year of Gary, 1978, the capital investment program was $8 million. The first year of the revolution, that figure was more than doubled. It went to $16 million. The second year of the revolution, it was doubled again. It went to $39.9 million. And by this time, the experts were saying, that is impossible. You don't have the resources. You don't have the management. You don't have enough tractors. You don't have enough trucks. You don't have enough engineers. You can't possibly do it. You are only lucky in 1979 when you double your own. And you're only lucky in 1980 again when you double your own. And then when we went to 1981, we double it again. They say, well, we don't have this luck, but something is wrong. You can't do that again. And then last year in 1982, 
It went up to over 100 million, and then we gave them the secret. We told them that in a revolution, things operate differently in the normal. Because in Grenada, consistent with our three pillars of the revolution, where the first pillar of the revolution is our people, who are always at the center and heart and focus of all of our activities, we are able to mobilize and organize the people to cut out waste, to cut out corruption, to stamp on inefficiency, to move to planning, to look out for production, to check on productivity, to make sure that state enterprises are not set up to be subsidized, but that state enterprises too must become viable, must make a profit, and therefore the state sector will then have to to bring the benefit. We have been able to pull our people into the whole economic process. And our people have gladly been pulled into the economic process because our people see the benefits which the revolution has brought to them. They understand that when 37 cents out of every dollar is spent on health and education, that means something. In this country, the figure is probably nearer to 10 cents on every dollar. They look around and they understand that year after year, inflation is being held reasonably in check. Last year it ran at 7%, while real wages ran at 10%, thus ensuring an overall increase in the standard of living of all of our people of 3%. An overall increase in the quality of life and of what they were able to receive. They are able to look around and recognize that year after year, production is increasing. Last year in the state sector, production went up by over 34%. And in the private sector, production also rose. Last year too, there was a tremendous rise in the export of non-traditional products, in the export of fruits and vegetables, for example, to Trinidad and Tobago and neighboring Caribbean islands to places as far away as the United Kingdom. The increase in exports of fruits and veg last year went up by over 314%, which is a massive increase in a short period. There were also increases in production in areas like flour, clothing, and there was a slight decrease in the area of furniture. But in the first three, relatively substantial increase. At the same time, there were some increases in the area of our traditional export crops, nutmegs, cocoa, and bananas. Though in the case of nutmegs, there has been a tremendous problem which our country has had to face, and that is to say, a great difficulty in obtaining sales for the nutmegs. When you are producing something like nutmegs, which is really meant primarily as a spicing flavor for foods. When there's a crisis or a recession or whatever the fancy name is you use, then people stop putting the spice in the food. <laughs> and therefore your nutmeg starts to pile up. And that is one of the difficulties too that we have faced. But our people in Grenada are not only able to see these economic achievements in the broad terms in which I have described them, but they are able to feel what these benefits mean to them in a concrete and material way. Because today in Grenada, the money that the people of Grenada used to have to spend, for example, when they went to a doctor or a dentist, that money they no longer have to spend because they now have free health care. They 
now understand that the number of doctors in the country has more than doubled. Moving from a ratio of one to every 4,000, one doctor for every 4,000 before the revolution, the present ratio is one doctor to every 2,700 of our population. <laughs> Moving from a situation before the revolution, where there was just one dental clinic for the whole country, Today, there are seven dental clinics, including one in our Oxford Island of California. <laughs> our people understand the value and the benefit of free secondary education because they know now that once their children are able to pass the common entrance exam, and get into secondary school, they no longer have to worry about finding those keys, which as you know for agricultural workers, for example, were very often impossible. But not just free secondary education, but in effect free university education. <laughs> Moving from a situation before the revolution, where in the last year of the year in 1978, just three people went abroad on university scholarships. And they happened to be Geary's daughter, and one of the minister's daughter. Moving from that situation, in the first six months of the revolution, 109 students went abroad. People are more and more getting to understand what we mean when we say that education to us is liberation. <laughs> that education is a strategic concern of this government. That is why that this year, 1982, is the year we have named the year of political and academic education, because we understand the importance of bringing education to the of raising their consciousness, of promoting worker education classes in the workplace, at the same time of giving them an academic education, of providing them with skills training, of ensuring that those who are not able to read and to write are now able to read and to write. <laughs> Following the establishment of the Center for Popular Education program in early 1980, within one year of the work of the CPE program, the illiteracy figure in Grenada was reduced to 2% of the entire population. And UNESCO, the United Nations body dealing with education, says if you have less than 5% illiteracy, you do not have an illiteracy problem. The fact is that while illiteracy has now been removed, there is still a serious problem of functional literacy. And therefore, the second phase of the Center for Popular Education program has started. In this phase of adult education, which our people at home call the night school, for two nights a week, and for three hours each in those two nights, in other words, six hours a week, agricultural workers, farmers in our country, clerical workers, factory workers, unemployed youth who are dropped out of school, more and more of them are now going to one of the 72 centers operating around our country. brothers to understand just how difficult this task is. If you can reflect back 
On the normal daily habits of the average agricultural worker throughout the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and to a great extent still today, if we are to be frank and honest, we understand how difficult it is to run an adult education program. The average agricultural worker goes to work early in the morning, goes home in the afternoon, goes and does a look back gardening, then maybe head by the rum shop to play some domino, <laughs> or sit down and talk with the partner. And to ask such an agricultural worker now to come out twice a week and go to a night school and for three hours to sit down and go through a formal educational course is really asking a lot. And even in the very first experience we had in the illiteracy phase in 1980, I remember holding several meetings from time to time with CPE mobilizers and CPE educators, and over and over again, those comrades would say that the problem is you can't persuade the system and brothers to be consistent. That some nights when they reach in the house and they knock on the door, and they say, Tanti, where are your husband? She said, not dead. I want you to look under the bed, this man hiding. <laughs> In other words, it really is a very difficult task. But it is a task which we are trying to accomplish. It is a task which teachers on a voluntary basis are helping to accomplish. And more and more now, our people are beginning to understand the importance, the total strategic importance of education on all fronts, political, academic, skills training, on all fronts, the importance of that. In a situation in particular like a country like Grenada, which unlike, let us say, a country like Vietnam, that does not have a certain kind of cultural background and tradition. Because what I thought is a background and tradition we have had. It is a background and tradition that has, that has generally speaking, worshipped materialism. It is a background and tradition that, generally speaking, has meant that because of the ravages of colonialism, our people have always seen themselves as transient. Our people have always had a visa mentality. And the whole point was to catch the next boat of play. Coming out of the colonial experience and fed daily all of the rubbish that we have fed through the newspapers, the radios, the televisions, where they are proclaiming the virtues of materialism, where they are proclaiming the importance of every single person having a video <laughs> and having the latest kind of radio that only come out six months ago, <laughs> not to mention the newest kind of shampoo. <laughs> that kind of thing feeds consumerism, feeds economism, yeah. and helps to pull the society back. In our countries, many people have as a sole aspiration the need to have a motor car. The fact that a motor car means foreign exchange earnings have to go out because we don't produce motor cars. The fact that it means that more money has to be spent on gas, these things are not so easily explainable because of the political education that is daily taking place through the imperialist media. Because that is political education they are pumping. It is political education. The reason the people of Vietnam are quite content and happy that virtually every citizen can ride around Vietnam on a bicycle is in part because they have not been exposed to the corrupt and decadent values which hundreds of them
But if we ask our people to take up a bicycle instead, of course, that is a problem. But Grenada is a double problem because Grenada is really one big mountain and bicycle is really cow. But the real point I'm making, sisters and brothers, is the nature of the struggle that we have on the ground, not only to raise production and productivity, but as we, in fact, instill new values in our people, as we struggle on the road towards creating a new man and a new woman, living a new life in what we know will become a new civilization, the old culture, the old habits, the old prejudices are always there struggling against the shoots of the new. And that is a struggle that we have to resolutely wage every single day of our life. But it is much easier for our people to make those sacrifices it is much easier for them to accept the importance of doing these things which they have not been in the habit of doing. Because now they know that for the first time material benefits are coming. Now they know that for the first time when they go out and they work harder, it is not for the fruits of their labor to go down to the evening palace or rock gardens or gold room or silver room. These are now the property of the people and the fourth part of the people. Our people now understand that what they put out will come back. Whether through free health care or free education, whether through the number of jobs that have been created, they know it is coming back. The free milk distribution program in our country. Last year, a small island like Grenada, 73,000 pounds of milk were distributed free every single month to over 50,000 people. They Under the house repair program in our country, over 17,240 individuals benefited from the housing repair program. And for those of you who don't know what the housing repair program is, let me tell you about it. Under this program, the poorest workers in our country, the agricultural workers, the road workers, the banana and pool workers, these poorest category of workers in our country are entitled to a loan to repair their homes, to fix the roofs, to fix the floors, to make sure that rain does not fall on the child while he's trying to study. And after the materials are given to the worker, the worker then repays over six years at the rate of five dollars a month out of his wages. Five dollars a month is less than two dollars United States a month. Five dollars a month means that the same amount of money that that worker would have had to get from a bank let us say that problem is now solved. Because if he had gone to a bank and knocked at a say at the door of Mr. Barclays, <laughs> the first thing Mr. Barclays would ask him is, where your collateral? <laughs> and maybe if he understands that big word, he pull out his cutlass and he says, no, no, no. But as far as that hurdle that he was able to find some collateral somehow or the other, there is still another hurdle that he has to go through. Because then he discovers that a loan could be only over one year, let us say for $2,000. That you have to pay 12.5% interest. And when we check with the banks, 
a $1,000 loan at 12.5% interest over 12 months would have meant a monthly repayment of over $88 a month, which means that just about no agricultural worker would have been able to afford it. And that is why today the agricultural workers understand what the revolution is about. Because they are sent the weight of the revolution. The people understand that in areas, in all areas of their basic needs, real attempts are being made to solve these problems. Two and a half million gallons more of water, pipe and water, are flowing into the homes of our Grenadians at this time. Before the revolution, under 30% of our homes had portable water. Before the revolution, in fact, in many homes and in many parts of the country, pipes had actually rusted up because water had not passed there for years. And the pipe just stayed there and corrugated. The people understand what it means when electrification is brought to their village. The people understand what it means when they know that by the end, the middle of next year, we would have doubled the electricity output and capacity in our country. And therefore, more people would have the opportunity of electricity. 30% of the lowest paid workers in our country no longer pay any income tax at all. So for these Old age pensioners, they had their pensions increased by 10% last year, and this year it is going up again by 12.5%. <laughs> Our people know that last year some $43 million was spent on the International Airport Project alone. And another $40 million will be spent on that project this year again. They know that last year over 49 miles of feeder roads were built. Feeder roads being the roads that connect the farmers to the main roads. So now the produce can be brought out safely. They know that apart from these 49 miles of feeder roads, that 15 miles of farm roads were also built and 14 new miles of main roads were also built, totaling therefore something like 78 new miles of roads in our country last year alone. Our people therefore, sisters and brothers, have a greater and deeper understanding of what the revolution means and what it has brought to them. They certainly understand very, very clearly that when some people attack us on the ground of human rights, when some people attack us on the ground of constituting a threat to the national security of other countries, our people understand that it's foolishness. They know the real reason has to do with the fact of the revolution and the benefits that the revolution are bringing to the people of our country. The real reason for all of this hostility is because some perceive that what is happening in Grenada can lay the basis for a new socio-economic and political <laughs> They give all kinds of reasons and excuses, some of them credible, some utter rubbish. There's an interesting one that we saw very recently in a secret report of the State Department. I want to tell you about that one. So you can reflect on that one. That secret report made this point. That Grenada is different to Cuba and Nicaragua. And the Grenada Revolution is in one sense even worse 
using their language, than the Cuban and Nicaraguan revolutions, because the people of Grenada and the leadership of Grenada speaks English, and then we can communicate directly. Already tried to kill Aliende once. The 
couldn't even wait for him to be formally inaugurated. Ariete did not form a militia. Ariete did not grab any land or property. Ariete had no political detainees. Ariete did not crush the press. He did not close down the parliament. He did not suspend the constitution. He played by every rule they wrote, or they killed him still. Line them up and shoot them down. That is one answer. 
Some other people yes. pretend yes. that they went into the bush and while they were in the bush as gorillas, they shoot them down too. Yes. Yes. Some other people create special courts to deal with them. I am not passing judgment on any of these three monkeys. What I say is that in Grenada, the Grenada Revolution did not have the appetite for any of those three months. So we took what we saw as a humanitarian cause, we tamed them and treated them well. And you know, is that any significant? That of the 400 to 500 people picked up by our masses on Revolution Day on the 13th of March, of those 400 to 500 picked up by the masses, picked up by the same unemployed youth whose heads the Mongoose gang and secret police were shaving and flushing down by the bulls. Not one of these Mongoose gang elements arrived in the jail with even a scratch on them. Not one came with a scratch. And the only reason that happens is because our people at home understand the principal position that a revolution takes on no revenge, no victimization, no torture, no ill treatment of anyone. It is because our people understood that. That's something that very often happens in all revolutions, the spontaneous upheaval of the masses did not really happen in Grenada. A church-based organization in Washington called Epica wrote a book last year in Grenada, they called it Grenada, the Peaceful Revolution. We can understand why. So when these elements come and make these statements, we understand only too well where they are coming from. Because they understand that the processes and the procedures for review are ongoing procedures. They understand that in Grenada, no one is ever interfered with for what he says. No one is ever interfered with for what he writes. In fact, today, criticism is deeper than ever in society in a constructive way. But our people also understand that the first law of the revolution is that the revolution must survive, must consolidate, so more benefits can come to them. And because of this fact, the revolution has laid down as a law that nobody regardless of who you are, will be allowed to be involved in any activity surrounding the overthrow of the government by the use of armed violence. And anyone who moves in that direction will be ruthlessly crushed. <laughs> also feel, sisters and brothers, that the time has in fact come for us to make another step along the way towards institutionalizing the process that we have been building for four years. And that is why only yesterday in Grenada, the new chairman of the Constitutional Commission arrived in our capital city, St. George's, from Trinidad and Tobago to announce the formation of the Constitutional Commission that has now undertaken the task of drafting a new constitution for our young revolution. <laughs> this constitution is not really going to look like the one that the Queen gave us. <laughs> In 1974. That constitution.
persecution. As you remember, one of the main reasons for the struggles of 73 and 74, when so many of us were beaten and jailed, when our families and compatriots were being murdered, one of the main reasons for that struggle was because our people were saying we wanted to be involved in the process of drafting the new constitution. And Gary did not allow us that right. And the Queen of England could have stayed in Buckingham Palace, put it in an envelope, put a stamp on it, and post it to Gary. That was the total involvement of Grenada in that constitution. This time around, this constitution is going to come out of the bowels of our people and out of our earth. Our people will have their interests and will decide what they want to see go into that constitution. This time around, that constitution will not just entrench empty rights, but will entrench rights and also provide remedies for the enforcement of those rights. The nature of our present constitution. Chapter 1 has 12 freedoms, fundamental freedoms. The right to this, the right to that, the right to that. But any time any of those rights are infringed, and you go before the court, the court to see if you can do something about that, first of all, it will only go by way of a constitutional motion. Secondly, that means you can only go in the high court, not the magistrate's court, which of course means money. And thirdly, once you reach the high court, even if the judge agrees with you and you win your case, the most the judge can give you is what they call a declaratory order, which declares your rights. And when you bring the declaratory order to the government, you then discover another maxim of the law. You cannot enforce against the crown. In other words, you have a paper judgment in your hand that you can't do nothing with. So all of these beautiful fantasy rights up and down the Caribbean constitutions that speak of freedom of expression and freedom of assembly and freedom of this, that and the other, you cannot enforce those things by any order you can enforce against the government. And any government that wishes to be arbitrary, it means they have a ready-made solution to the problem. We are going to want to put rights into the constitution which rights can be enforced in a way that the people can themselves manage and which rights, once the remedies are provided, the remedies will in fact be allowed by our government. A constitution with real teeth. Our new constitution also is certainly going to institutionalize and entrench the systems of popular democracy which we have been building over the past four years. <laughs> Apart from the usual national elections, which will of course be there too, we are going to ensure that these embryonic organs of popular democracy, which we have been building these past four years, continue to have reflection. Because to us, democracy is much, much more than just an election. Yeah, that's right. To us, democracy is a great deal more than just the right to put an X next to Tweedledum name or Tweedledee name <laughs> every five years. But democracy also means, and to us it has five integrated components. First, accountability. People have to account to those who elected. People have to come before those who have elected them and give an account of their stewardship from time to time, not just once in four years or five years. <laughs> the second principle of democracy to us, responsibility. So the elected officials must at all times ensure that the mandate they are carrying out if mandate it is, is the mandate that people want. And part of that responsibility question means the right of recall of those who elect must be in We don't believe in Grenada and presidents for life. 
or elected people for life. We believe in service for life. And when you stop serving, you must be recalled and get off the way for somebody else. The third principle. To us, the third principle of democracy is participatory mechanisms, popular participation. If we are serious about democracy, and here we accept the definition, the well-known definition of Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln said of democracy that it is government of, for, and by the people. I accept that. It's a good definition. <laughs> but if it is government of, for, and by the people, then it cannot be just government of the people you elect. It also has to be for them, and it also has to be by them. They have to have a way of participating. That is what the word by means. And if that happens, they don't really have to So we are saying we need to have mechanisms that ensure that the people have a way of giving expression to their own feelings and concerns. In some of the more developed industrialized countries that have had hundreds of years to build a democracy, a number of things have developed over the period that are perhaps helpful. Some of them are genuinely free and responsible press. Some of them genuinely allow all sections to express their views. Some of them are very effective lobbies where virtually every interest in the society can find a way to get their matter raised in Congress or Parliament. Some of them, of course, have a highly literate people and a highly developed public opinion are people who can interpret for themselves to some extent. In those situations, it may or may not be correct that one form or the other of democracy, let us say Westminster parliamentary democracy, may well be acceptable to the people of England. I cannot speak to that. But I know that for the people of Grenada, at this stage in our history, Westminster parliamentary democracy is really Westminster parliamentary hypocrisy. <laughs> we believe that it is very important for the people to have a voice in running their affairs. The ways in which we have approached this question over these years is basically twofold. One, the creation of mass organizations of all people. The National Women's Organization, the National Youth Organization, the Farmers Union, and of course the Labor Union, the Trade Union. Before the revolution, Gary had passed the law in 1978, the Essential Services Act, which took away the right to strike from the workers of our country. We not only repealed that law, but instead we passed a new law recognition of trade union law, under which any time in any workplace, 51% of the workers indicate that they want to form or to join a union of their choice, that union must be recognized by the employer. <laughs> Not only were the women of our country without work before the revolution, the women of our country were also the most harassed and victimized of any section of our population. Those few who were granted jobs from time to time, many of them were given those jobs only on the basis of a sexual favor. The women were being sexually exploited in return for jobs. The very first decree of the revolution was to outlaw sexual victimization and exploitation of all women. <laughs> and going on from that, sisters and brothers, the revolution then passed the law applying to all the workers in the public sector of equal pay for equal work for all of the women in the public sector in our country. We also did 
then passed another law more recently, a maternity leave law. And by this maternity leave law, every woman who is pregnant must be granted three months maternity leave, two months with full pay, one could be without full pay, and a guarantee of return to employment after the pregnancy. It is because of these laws and because of the new environment in the country that so many women have begun to step forward, have begun to assert themselves, have begun to go out and find new jobs, have begun to get fully involved in production. And that is why too so many of them have joined their mass organization so that today at this point in time one in every three adult women, women over the age of 16 years is a member of the National Women's Organization. <laughs> and in this organization, the women are able to experience training in democracy, training in self-rule, training in acquiring a new country. Once in every two months, they hold their parish meetings. They are also broken up, of course, into groups around the country, where, among other things, they conduct political education and provide training opportunities. Once in every two years at their Congress, all the women have the opportunity of electing delegates for six months before the Congress. They have the opportunity of discussing the new program for the next two years. And then on the day of the Congress, they elect the entire new leadership by a secret ballot. So within our mass organizations, the principle of electability is already entrenched. And for our people in general, there have been some organs of popular democracy that have been built. Zonal councils, parish councils, worker parish councils, farmer councils, where the people come together from month to month and the usual agenda would be a report on programs taking place in the village. Then there would be a report usually by some senior member of the bureaucracy. It might be the manager of the Central Water Commission, or it might be the manager of the telephone company or the electricity company, or it might be the chief sanitary inspector or the senior price control inspector. And this senior bureaucrat has to go there and report to the people on his area of work and then be submitted to a question and answer session. And after that, one of the top leaders in our country, one of us will also attend those meetings and ourselves give a report. And usually there is question and answer time at the end of that also. In this way, our people from day to day and week to week are participating in helping to run the affairs of their country. And this is not just an abstract matter of principle. It has all every now and then when they were hearing of detainees and election and press is finished, you would them say, well, Soviet and Cuba satellite. You would them say that the links with Cuba are such that it is dangerous to the security of the region. What do we say on this? We say, first of all, that yes, we have warm, fraternal relations with the government and people of <laughs> We say, secondly, that to us, this is a matter of fundamental principle. And there are at least three very good reasons why we will always have good relations with the government and people of Cuba. The first reason, we see Cuba as part of our Caribbean family of nations. One of the greatest curses of colonialism was that they, they divided
dividing the region according to different metropolitan centers. They taught us different languages. And then we made a great say of the fact that you are Dutch speaking, you are Spanish speaking, you are French speaking, you are English speaking, and more recently, you are American speaking. <laughs> And based on this linguistic nonsense, they taught us to hate each other. When we were growing up in school, they used to make us believe that the sun sets only in England. We used to be made to go on the Queen's birthday, down to Queen's Park, and stand up in the hot sun all day. the day we hot and sweaty and tired and they give us a bun. And I remember this in John's ambulance for days I have in the corner in case you think they catch your finger. And you know the first time I realized just how deep this foolishness went. And the extent to which they were miseducating us and trying to make us into little black Englishmen when I landed in England for the first time. Because when I landed in England to go and study law in 1963, one of my first and greatest experiences, shocking experience, traumatic, was when I went somewhere one day, national anthem started to play, poor little black man jump up at <laughs> When I look around, me alone standing up every day. Great Grenadian. So articulate. Spiral points out in one of his best songs that the way they were educating us, they were really educating us to make us into fools. They have all the country singing, Spiral sing about in that song, how they make the cow jump over them. There's all this stupidness we have to learn. But the fact of the matter is that they come down. They tell us if you speak in Dutch, you're the best. If it's English, you're the best. French is the best. Spanish is the best. American is the best. And all of us hating each other. When in fact we are one people from one Caribbean. <laughs> one one. We see it therefore as one of our historic duties and responsibilities to pull down these artificial barriers of colonialism <laughs> and to develop that one and that race that makes us. We believe it is critically necessary to have close relations with all of our neighbors. That is why I have done state visits to Mexico, to Venezuela, to Panama, to Cuba, to Nicaragua, to Ecuador. The reason has been a conscious attempt on the part of this new government to try to build those bridges and to make sure that all of this alienation of the past disappears. That is the first reason. The second reason is we are a non-aligned country. We believe in non-aligned. And to us, non-alignment means that you have the right to choose your own friends. <laughs> non-alignment to us means that we have the right and the duty to diversify and expand our relationships and our friendships around the world. Non-alignment to us is not something that implies neutrality, like if in a corner. Non-alignment is not meant to make you into a political eunuch that can ask you. Non-alignment is meant to make you speak out loud and clear for what you believe in. Well, there is also a 
third reason that we will always have relations, warm, fraternal, close relations with the people of the government of Cuba. And that is our admiration and our respect for the internationalism and the achievements of the Cuban in this hemisphere to have succeeded. And if there was no Cuban revolution, there could have been no Grenada on the Canadian side. Whether they like it or not, Cuba was the first country in this hemisphere to give us some licking to U.S. imperialism. <laughs> Whether they like it or not, Cuban internationalist soldiers have been the first in the world to charge the racist South African <laughs> internationalist troops in Angola. How long ago with a South African apartheid monster have overrun Angola with the assistance of several Western powers? Cuba is a great stabilizing factor in that Angola equation. And that is why when they come up with this hypocrisy of linkage and say that for Namibia to get independence, Cuban troops have to leave. We who are in the third world understand and have seen their block and will fully back the Cuban soldiers and their whole of Cuba. They can have their revolution. They can do what they want with it. They can choose their South African and their Haitian and Chilean and South Korean and every piece of dictator friends they wish. That is okay. But we can't choose our friends. Because we too small and poor back the rest They like to talk a lot about backyard and front yard and lake. Grenada ain't nobody back Try to keep the poor oppressed people of the world 
who are trying to win their national liberation and to build their own future down. Think of Nicaragua. Nicaragua, a country invaded over the years two, three times in this century by the United States. Nicaragua, a country that has been under the brutal heel of the Somozas for over 45 years. Nicaragua, a country that just like the Americans 200 years ago finally resorted to their supreme right to overthrow their oppressors and murderers and to take their destiny into their own hands. <laughs> and when the people of Nicaragua, when the sons and daughters of San Dino assumed their liberation, when they won in July of 79, what was the crime that they committed thereafter? Their crime was to be bold and mannish and fresh enough to say that their resources belong to them. To say that they want to build their country in their own way. To say that they want to choose their own friends. To say that they are going to build their country after their own image and likeness and not after the image and likeness of somebody else. And because of that, you have the situation where today the most vulgar, shameless act of the last year or so can only fail into comparison when you put it against what is happening in El Salvador or when you place it against what happened in the middle of last year in Lebanon when the Palestinian people were closer The most vulgar, shameless act of open CIA activity in the country. The most open, vulgar, shameless act of even admitting that not only will they resort to covert actions, but if necessary, they will publicly back covert actions against the Nicaragua. The shamelessness of it can only be exceeded by the way which sections of the media have chosen to respond. To pretend that the Nicaraguans are losing popular support. To pretend that these murderers, ex homosexual elements, are some kind of freedom fighters. <laughs> to pretend that, that these butchers who will just throw bombs on women and children as they are passing and run when they see the Sandinista soldiers to pretend that these people deserve to have some opportunity to rule the people of Nicaragua. No. The shamelessness of it is really extraordinary. And perhaps the only good thing that has come out of this recent episode, Sister the Birds, is the fact that for the first time in a long time, the people of Latin America themselves have tried to find a solution to the problem. That has been the historic meaning of the get-together of Venezuela, Colombia, Mexico, and Panama on Contadora to launch the Contadora Initiative. Because what this Contadora Initiative is all about is really extremely important for us. It says, first of all, that we, the people of Latin America and the Caribbean, will try to solve our problems ourselves. Right. It says, secondly, that we do not accept the use of violence as a means of settling all disputes. It says, thirdly, that we must always sit down and engage in negotiations and discussions before taking any other measures. And it says, fourthly, that we are not prepared.
fail to accept that any country in our region, far less any country outside our region, has the right to interfere in the internal affairs of another country. And even though this Contadora initiative is fast becoming all things to all men, you heard this about everybody saying yes, they're back in Contadora. Which must mean that some people try to use Contadora in ways different to which the original objectives were intended. It nonetheless is a historic first step. But these people have also thrown out another allegation against Grenada. I want to deal with it because I know people want to go home. It's getting late. <laughs> National Airport Project. This one is, of course, the most comical one of all. <laughs> According to the formulators of this famous theory, Grenada's International Airport is now going to become a military base and will now become a strategic jump off point from where we can launch an attack on the great, big, powerful, mighty United States. <laughs> it looks like it. we have become a Super Bowl. <laughs> but the reality of the airport, of course, is well known to all those who make those statements. This airport is an ancient dream of the people of our country. This international airport has undergone a quarter century of studies. There are more than six voluminous reports and studies on this international airport. All previous governments from 1955 have spoken about the need for the airport. And if you understand the situation in our country, that would be no surprise to anybody. The present airport is called Pearls. Pearls has a strip 5,500 feet long. That means only little turboprop planes can come in. The turboprop planes that come in carry a maximum of 48 passengers. And better still, these planes can only land during the day between 6 and 6 because there are no night lights. And we cannot put night lights because the airstrip happens to be conveniently located between the mountain and the sea. And unless we knock down the whole of the island, you can't put no international airport in Perth. The question of the length of the strip, the basis on which we have to make a strip of 9,000 feet, is because all of the manuals that were done by European and American companies. I can think of McDonnell Douglas, people who do the DC-8 and such. I can think of the Boeings. They have produced manuals saying what length of strip is required if their planes are to land. So unless we burn big and stupid, you can't expect us to put down a strip that planes that can carry people, normal jet planes, we won't be able to use. So the fact of the matter is the 9,000 feet was dictated by the necessity for that. This famous military base, <laughs> let me tell you that in a different way, I'll give you a joke about it. After President Reagan's statements, one television crew, ABC in fact, came to the country. And they came and they, had, they wanted to do an interview and they had a big fat file with all the questions. But the main question focused around the fact that we were building a sophisticated military base or at least a sophisticated military strip. So he said, okay, let's go down to the airport, take some photographs. So these people went down there and they took photographs. They discovered that the airport had become the number one tourist attraction of the country. Every 
story scenario that we're not taking at all. They discovered that at the end of the strip, which is also the end of the peninsula, at least two dozen Grenadians go every single evening to fish. <laughs> they discovered that right at the beginning of the strip, at a distance of this podium, to let us say the front row of that balcony, a few inches away, is where the medical school with 700 American students live and study. And they discovered that these medical school students, American students, were running up and down the strip jogging every day and every night. ABC television also discovered that there was in fact a terminal building being constructed. Because if you remember President Reagan's photograph, the one the spy plane took, there was a nice big cloud covering the terminal building, quite by accident, of course. <laughs> but when these people went down, that accident did not take place, so they caught the terminal building. So they came back, they put it on the night line, and the people of America were able to see that here genuinely was an international airport with a full terminal building. But two days later, ABC comes back, same crew. As I say, what's, what's the problem now, fellas? <laughs> they say, all right. They say they agree it's not a sophisticated airbase. They won't say that again. They're sorry about that. But they now discover we have sophisticated communication facilities. <laughs> so we say, all right. We don't know anything about them. We don't know where they are. But feel free, go around the country. If you can find them, we also would like to see them. <laughs> so they spent another day or two going around. They didn't find it. They go back. They send the film back again. After asking questions and satisfying themselves, this was also an answer. Would you believe the next day, a day afterwards, they were back again? <laughs> in other words, three times in six days, and this time they came back, they said, we have another question for you. It is not sophisticated military base, it is not sophisticated communication facilities, but we understand you all have sophisticated barracks. <laughs> of course, they went around, they discovered the sophisticated barracks they were talking about was no more than the temporary sheds which had been constructed on the airport site in which the Grenadian and the Cuban workers who are building the airport are living. They also discovered that time, they also discovered that time, that on the same airport site are workers from a British company called Plessy and workers from a Finnish company called Metex who are down there right now installing the communication equipment, the navigational aids, the electronics, etc. All the things you need to get an airport functional. Working and living together. They also then discovered that last year an American company called Lane's Dredging from Miami spent nine months in Grenada helping to build this famous military base. <laughs> that this company was dredging a section of the sea where the strip has to pass, a section called Hardy Bay. And therefore, for these nine months, they too were working and living with Grenadian and Cuban workers building this airport. So I said to these fellows, well, look, as you know, Grenada relies in part on tourism. So we don't mind seeing you all again. I don't mind just sending you back home tomorrow. Well, if you're coming back down tomorrow, try to bring a few more in. <laughs> and secondly, if they were tell you it's sophisticated something else, at least make sure they come better than saying sophisticated pants or socks or shoes. <laughs> they don't really become that ludicrous. This international airport project, as we see it, is the gateway to our future. As we see it, 
it is what alone can give us the potential for economic takeoff. As we see it, can help us to develop the tourist industry more, can help us to develop our agro industries more, can help us to export our fresh fruits and vegetables better. This international airport also has every Grenadian who has gone back home. And as anybody here in this audience who has ever traveled to Grenada will know, coming to Grenada right now is a literal nightmare. <laughs> coming to Grenada right now is like a labor of love. You have to be a martyr to want to come. A amount that trouble will make you see. And what this airport will do is remove all of that trouble and inconvenience and allow our people to fly straight in. <laughs> why we have made an exception this year. Usually every year at the end of December, we announce what the next year will be called. You know, a year of education, production, or whatever it is. But last month, six and a half months ahead of schedule, we announced to our people what the name of next year will be. So they can start from now to mobilize, including mobilizing overseas around the name because 1984 next year will be called the Year of International Airport. <laughs> and the fact of the matter is, next year is also significant for us, because on the 13th of March, 84, it will be the fifth anniversary of the revolution. And as you know, people always make a, a fuss about the first revolution, the first anniversary, about the fifth anniversary, about the tenth anniversary, and so on. So we have reason to make an extra fuss next year. And therefore, what we want to do during the fifth festival on the 13th of March itself is to open our international airport. and brothers there, and particularly to our Grenadian nationals, that there is a tremendous amount of enthusiasm and excitement building all over the world by Grenadian state, because all of them want to be on the first flight that are coming. <laughs> so when I was in London last, last month, addressing a rally much like this one, the Grenadians in the audience were all insisting that they would organize an inaugural flight. But the one condition is they must be the first plane to touch down. <laughs> so what we have decided to do, because of course we can't have all that number of first, is to settle for inaugural flights by zones or by cities. London will have its own inaugural, Liverpool will have its own inaugural, New York, no doubt, will have its own inaugural, Washington is going to have its own inaugural. And what is going to be important, sisters and brothers, is to make sure you get onto that inaugural, because as you realize, you will be coming down to see the most widely publicized airport in the world has ever known.
long live the leader right now.